our next lecture topic focuses on the concept of atomic term symbols. And as I've said before, atomic term symbols are really just a shorthand notation, or if you prefer, a bookkeeping notation for grouping sets of degenerate wave functions, that is, sets of wave functions all with exactly the same energy. And in the case of atomic term symbols, atomic wave functions, which we described, as I said in my last lecture, by Slater determinants, these groupings are based entirely on angular momentum, that is, orbital angular momentum, spin angular momentum, and then a coupling of spin and orbital angular momentum for the total angular momentum. We're going to see how these all come together. But to begin with, I'll show you the general structure of an atomic term symbol, this shorthand notation, and then we'll go through a series of examples to try to help flesh out what all these components are and how to interpret them. So let's start with what the structure is of that shorthand notation. A sh a, an atomic term symbol has three components. The first is the main body, which I'll represent by a capital L. And this is the total orbital angular momentum of the electron. So we use the symbol capital L. And then there's a left-hand superscript that involves the total spin angular momentum of all the electrons, S. And 2s plus 1 is therefore a number that we put as the left-hand superscript that describes the spin multiplicity. So let's summarize those two components. First, there's the orbital angular momentum. Right, ang mom as I've been abbreviating it. And then there's the spin multiplicity. So if you know what the total S spin angular momentum quantum number is for your set of electrons, you get spin multiplicity as 2s plus 1. That's the number of identical spin states, as we've seen before. There's the right-hand subscript that gets added to this, which we symbolize by the letter J, and that corresponds to the total angular momentum which we will obtain by coupling the values of L and S here, the orbital angular momentum and the spin angular momentum. Again, we'll talk more about, about what that means, but how do we put this thing together? What are, the S, 2S plus 1, that is, that's going to be a number, as you'll see. J is also going to be a number, but L, whereas it has a value, we usually write down a Latin character for this. So L can take on values, just like we found for the orbital angular momentum associated with a single electron, even for many electrons, capital L can take on values that are non-negative integers. So, but we don't use those numbers here for L. Instead, we use the symbol, much like we do for hydrogen-like orbitals. So if capital L is a zero, then we use a capital S, not to be confused with our spin angular momentum quantum number. That's a symbol used for capital L equals zero. If L is one, we use a capital P. If L is 2, you use a capital D, you know where we're going with this. Uh, if it's 3, then you use a capital F, and 4, capital G, and so on, H, etc. So again, 2s plus 1 will be a number. J will also be a number, but this symbol, capital L, that once we've figured out the numerical value of L, we're going to replace it with the appropriate Latin character. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let's start with an example. We're going to start with a hydrogen atom. That's, that's the one that is easiest because we've written down exactly what the hydrogen atom wave functions look like and characterized them in terms of principal quantum number, orbital angular momentum quantum number, and z component of angular momentum quantum number. But don't forget, we also need to characterize them by spin. And for a single electron, as we saw in the last lecture, a single electron has a spin angular momentum quantum number of one half and a corresponding z component of spin angular momentum quantum number, m sub s, of either plus one half, which we call alpha, or minus one half, which we call beta. So for a hydrogen atom, I might write down the ground state electronic configuration to be 1s1. So I have one electron in a 1s type spatial orbital. And again, we know how to actually write down the mathematical form for that in the case of a hydrogen atom. Now, for that single electron that we're dealing with, I know that my angular momentum quantum number, which we've called little l, is zero. Since I only have one electron, 
that little l for that single electron is now the same as capital L. So capital L is zero. So therefore I'm going to use the symbol s for that state. That makes sense because my one electron is in a 1s type spherical orbital. That, or, that electron also has a spin angular momentum quantum number, little s, that's what we used before, and we know that the value for a single electron of s is one half. Okay? That's, that's uh, the only possible value for the spin angular momentum quantum number of a single electron. And because I have a single electron, that little s value corresponding to one electron is also equal to what we call capital S that's going to go into the spin multiplicity component of the atomic term symbol. So already now I have two of the components that need to go into my atomic term symbol. Capital L is zero, means I'm going to use the symbol S for the angular moment, orbital angular momentum part. 2S plus 1, well if S is 1 half, 2 times 1 half is 1, plus 1 is 2. So I can see from these two components that the term symbol is has a superscript 2 for the spin multiplicity and a capital S for the orbital angular momentum representation. Now I haven't dealt with J yet, but I'm about to. The way we say this part, the way you, you refer to this out loud, is this is a doublet S. Doublet S. Why would the spin multiplicity be a doublet? That implies 2, right? Well, because for this capital S of 1 half, that means that I have capital M sub S, that is the Z component of the total spin angular momentum of either plus 1 half or minus 1 half. But as you know, it doesn't matter if I put that lone electron as an alpha spin or a beta spin in my hydrogen 1s orbital. The energy expression for a hydrogen atom only depends on the principal quantum number, in this case 1, and not on either the spin quantum number or the orbital angular momentum quantum number. It's exactly the same, right? So whether or not it's an alpha spin or a beta spin, the energy of that hydrogen atom is the same. Since I've got alpha and beta spins that have identical energies, that's a twofold degeneracy. That's where we get this 2s plus 1. That twofold degeneracy, which is the reason the 2 here, here appears in the superscript, we call that a doublet. So the phrasing of this is doublet S. That would be the name of the term symbol. Be sure you don't say 2S or all the electronic spectroscopists will laugh at you. You want to get this right and say it's a doublet S term symbol. Okay, but I'm not done. What about this total angular momentum component, the J component? J is also an angular momentum, but it arises from recognizing that spin, an angular momentum, and orbital, an L, an orbital angular momentum, these two can couple to each other. Right? If you've been to an amusement park and you've had to ride the teacups, right? you know that the teacups are spinning on their own axis, and they're on top of a big platform that's also spinning. And you can control the direction that your teacup that you're sitting in is spinning, and you can make it actually couple to the angular momentum of the whole platform and get spinning really fast. Or you could actually turn it against the angular momentum of the platform and have them cancel each other out. In the same way, the spin angular momentum of our electron or electrons can couple to the orbital angular momentum of our electrons and either uh, add constructively or destructively. So they either can bump each other up or they can cancel each other out. And we, we denote that, that interference, right, constructive or destructive interference between the orbital angular momentum vectors and spin angular momentum vectors as the total orbital angular momentum j. So the allowed values of j correspondingly are capital L plus capital S, that's the maximum possible value of the two, that's where they're interfering constructively, they're, they're helping each other out, all the way down to L sub S minus 1, excuse me, L plus S minus 1, L plus S minus 2, etc., all the way down to a minimum value of absolute value of L minus S. So you can see there's only positive values allowed, but the maximum is L plus S, and the minimum is, is absolute value of L minus S, and there's integer steps in between. So for this particular case, it's really easy to calculate. 
capital J, in this case, is going to be L plus S, so that's one half. But the absolute value of L minus S is also one half. Therefore, the only allowed value of J is one half for this particular case. Again, the maximum is one half. The minimum is one half, so that's the only possibility, is j equals one half. So I will extend my term symbol here to give a doublet s one half state. So instead of just saying doublet s, I might say doublet s one half. You can see from this then that you can grab the entire degeneracy of the state, and again, this term symbol denotes a single energy level. All of the wave functions that contribute to that energy level are collected into this one notation. And you can get that degeneracy, that is the number of wave functions that contribute to that energy, from just the J part. The degeneracy of the term symbol is 2J plus 1. And so in this case, it's really quite simple. In this case, it's just 2. So a total degeneracy of the, of the term symbol is simply 2. All right. That's a hydrogen atom in its ground state. Let's try a different one. Let's keep to one electron, but now let's try a hydrogen atom, say, in a 2p excited state. So we're going we're gonna to stick with a hydrogen atom so that I only have one electron, but now I'm going to move that electron up into a 2p orbital. Now, you know that there are actually three 2p orbitals. There's the plus one, m sub l values differentiating them, the plus one, the zero, or the minus one. But there's also two m sub s possibilities, right? There's the plus one half, or alpha, and then the minus one half. This is for our single electron. So I could write all of these out, right? All of these possible configurations. I could write one, zero, and minus one. So I'm denoting the m sub l values underneath each of these. I could put an alpha spin electron in the m sub l equals plus one. Or here's another possibility. I could put the alpha spin electron in the m sub l equals zero. Or I could put the alpha spin electron in the m sub l equals minus one. Or I could put a beta spin electron in the m sub l equals plus one. Or a beta spin electron in the in this m sub l equals zero. Or a beta spin electron in the m sub l equals minus one. So writing out all of these possibilities, what am I going to do with that lone electron? I've got six possibilities. Now let's keep that in mind. There's six possibilities. You also know that because this is a hydrogen atom, the energy associated with that 2p1 electron only depends on the principal quantum number 2. So you could calculate explicitly what that energy is. And note that all of these different wave functions must therefore have the same energy because they all have exactly the same principal quantum number. Now don't forget, in the last lecture, we talked about Slater determinants and that this notation where I'm drawing arrows next to lines actually denotes a Slater determinant, this anti-symmetrized wave function. But of course, anti-symmetry doesn't mean anything here because I only have one electron to keep up with. That makes life simpler. It will become more interesting as soon as we get to a helium atom and we have two electrons to keep up with. But We'll hold that off for a few minutes. So I've got my six possibilities for my lone electron in 2p in a 2p shell. We call the 1, 0, minus 1 set a shell here, OK? So how am I going to denote the term symbol for this? Well, first of all, I'm going to have to figure out what l and s are. Little l and little s are, in this case, little l is 1 because I'm in a p-type orbital. Remember, m sub l is 1, 0, or minus 1, but let's just ignore that. That doesn't come into the term symbol, at least not yet. Little s is 1 half, because it's an electron, one electron. But since I only have one electron, little l is the same thing as capital L, and little s is the same thing as capital S. Remember the difference between our lowercase and our uppercase letters. The little ones here refer to a single electron. The capital letters refer to all of the electrons I have in the system. So in this case, since I only have one electron, they have to be the same. Okay, little l and capital L, little s and capital S. Okay, therefore, now let's take these together and let's come up with capital J. Remember, the maximum value of capital J is capital L plus capital S. Well, that's three halves, right? One plus one half, so three halves. Now, what's the absolute value of L minus S, right, which is this component here? 
capital L minus S, that's one half. So maximum value of J is three halves, minimum value of J is one half. Those are the only two possibilities because again we take integer steps in between. Therefore, I can put together the complete term symbol for a 2P1 state. I have a superscript, since capital S is 1 half, the superscript is 2S plus 1, so again, I have a doublet superscript. Since capital L is 1, that corresponds to a P type state. But now I have two possibilities for J. I have a separate term symbol for each of those J's going along with this doublet P. So I have a doublet P three halves, and I have a doublet P one half. So this means, again, let's think about the interpretation of these atomic term symbols. Each of these symbols represents a group of wave functions, a group of wave functions all with the same energy. That means that I have two groups of wave functions in this case, one of which that correspond to J equals three halves. They all have the same energy. And here another one, another group corresponding to j equals one half, those have the same energy. How many or, uh, wave functions are in each of these two groups? Okay, the degeneracy of the left-hand atomic term symbol is two j plus one, so that means it's a degeneracy of four. Degeneracy of four corresponding to 2j plus 1, where j is 3 halves. The degeneracy of the right-hand term symbol, again, it's 2j plus 1, that's equal to 2. So the left-handed term symbol gives me four wave functions all with the same energy. The right hand gives me two wave functions with the same energy. And notice, they add up to 6, which is exactly the number of possible configurations of my alpha or beta electron in my 2p shell. It has to add up this way, right? So 4 plus 2 is 6, giving me two different energy levels. Which of those energy levels is lower than the other? We'll get to that soon when we get to something called Huns rules. All right, we've done our one electron cases. Now let's move to the two electron possibility, right? We're going to move up from hydrogen to helium and see what happens. Let's just use this middle ground here. We're going to go with the ground state of the helium atom. Now I have two electrons that I have to contend with. Each of those electrons has a little l value. Each of those electrons has a little s value. Let's write those out first. I'll call for electron 1, I'll say l1, and that's 0. For electron 2, it has a quantum number, orbital angular momentum quantum number, l. Now, and it's also zero because both electrons are in an S-type orbital, right? Next, S1, it's an electron. The only possible value for a single electron is one half. The same thing goes for the other electron of my pair. They're both S1 half. Notice I didn't say anything about their M sub S values, right? For a single electron, it can either be plus one half or alpha or minus one half beta. We'll get to that shortly. In the meantime, these are my possibilities. L, both, for both electrons, little l is zero. For both electrons, s is one half. Now, spin is an angular momentum. Each electron has a spin angular momentum vector. Those spin angular momenta can couple constructively or destructively. So to get the total s, that is our capital S for our two electron system, this corresponds to s1 plus s2 s1 plus s2 minus 1, minus 2, etc., all the way down to absolute value of s1 minus s2. In other words, this works just like j that we saw before when we coupled l and s. To get the total spin angular momentum of my two electrons, the maximum allowed value for capital S is s1 plus s2. The minimum is absolute value of s1 minus s2. So, since these are both 1 half, the allowed values of capital S are either 1 or 0, nothing else. We'll come back to what that means, but just for this case, the maximum is 1, the minimum is 0, therefore there's nothing else in between since I have to go in unit steps. Orbital angular momentum, capital L works exactly the same way, and in this case it's particularly trivial, but capital L1 is L1 plus L2, 
L1 plus L2 minus 1, etc., down to a minimum value of L1 minus L2, absolute value. But both L1 and 2 are, L, are 0 in this case. Therefore, the only possibility for this state is L of 0. And that's because both electrons are in an S-type orbital, right, which has no orbital angular momentum. We now have our possible values of our capital S quantum number, total spin quantum number, and our capital L. L can only be 0, whereas S can be 1 or 0. But we need to examine that 1 a little bit more closely. Just as we had for little l possible m sub l values that were limited by what little l was, and we have for little s possible m sub s values, we have a similar situation with z components of orbital and spin angular momentum for our total capital L and capital S values. So capital m sub l is allowed to take on values of positive l, L minus 1, all the way down to an absolute value of, uh, excuse me, not absolute value, but a, a, a minimum value of negative L. Similarly, capital M sub S, excuse me, M sub S takes on capital S, capital S minus 1, etc., down to minus S. So it works exactly the same way as their, their lowercase counterparts when you're only talking about a single electron, except again, these refer to many electrons. For a given capital S, I, I can see that if capital S equals 1 here, for example, then capital M sub S can have values of 1, 0, and minus 1. Those are the possibilities. For each of those individual M sub S values, or M sub L values, I can see that the absolute value of M sub S is little m sub S 1 plus little m sub S two for my two electron system. Similarly for capital M sub L, its absolute value is little m sub L one plus little m sub L two. If I have multiple electrons, I simply have to sum even more terms. One of these m sub L or m sub S values for each electron. So what does that mean? If I take on, for example, a capital S value of one for my two electron system where both electrons are in a one S type orbital, if capital M sub S equals one, one of the allowed values of m sub s is plus 1. The only way that can happen, the only way I can get a plus 1, the z component of m sub s, that z component of spin angular momentum, is for both the m sub s values for electrons 1 and 2 to be plus 1 half. Okay? So if m sub s equals 1, that's capital M sub s, then m sub s 1 for electron 1 and m sub s 2 for electron 2 both equal 1 half, plus 1 half. But the only way to do that is if they're both alpha spin. If they're both alpha spin, then I'm looking at something that, as we discussed earlier, violates the Pauli anti-symmetry or, more specifically, the Pauli exclusion principle. Therefore, therefore, capital S of 1 must correspond to both electrons being alpha spin, because I sum the m sub s values, but that violates the Pauli exclusion principle, so that one's disallowed. And I'll just say it explicitly here. This violates Pauli. Therefore, for our helium 1s2 configuration, the only possible value of capital S for our two electrons is zero, and the only possible value of capital L for our two electrons is zero, and therefore J, which couples L and S, also can only be zero. And so my term symbol for this 1s2 state is 2s plus 1, which is 1, capital L is zero, which corresponds to S, and J corresponds to 0, which is 0. And what do we say here? Not 1s0, but we say singlet s0. I'll say it again, singlet s0. So make sure you pronounce it correctly in that sense. All right, what does this mean? This means that my closed shell, in which my two electrons are paired in the wave function, corresponds to no spin angular momentum. That's s equals 0. 
and corresponds to no orbital angular momentum. That's L equals zero. And since neither S nor L has any angular momentum associated with it, the total angular momentum that couples them is also zero. This is a zero angular momentum state. What's the degeneracy? You take it from J, yes? The degeneracy in this case Two j plus one, which equals one. In other words, there's only one wave function. We wrote it down before, as a, as a matter of fact, approximately anyway, as a Slater determinant with a new orbital approximation. There's only one wave function, and therefore there's only one energy associated with it. All right. Now there's a take-home message that's going to be important for later, and I want to I want to put a little star next to it. This is an important result, and the fact is that. Whenever I have all paired electrons in a shell, and in this case there's only one orbital in the shell, but when I fill up a shell completely with paired electrons, so filled shells do not contribute to the spin orbital or total angular momentum. That's an important result because we're going to look at a lot of different states in which, as we're about to see with the carbon atom, we have several filled shells and then an incompletely filled shell. All those filled shells contribute nothing to the angular momentum and we can ignore them. And we can only work on the shells in which we have incomplete numbers of electrons. And I'm about to come to an example of that. Let's do one more uh, two electron example before we get to, to helium, uh, excuse me, to carbon. And we're going to do, instead of the 1s2 state of a helium atom, now we're going to do a 1s1, 2s1. This is an excited configuration of helium. So let me get rid of these. Let's draw it. So this is going to be a helium 1s1, 2s1 excited configuration. Now, I could write this schematically, right? I could draw something like this. Two energy levels, one labeled 1s, one labeled 2s, and I could put in my two electrons. But how? What, what am I going to do? Am I going to put both electrons? Maybe I'll put them in both spin up. That's probably how you were taught to do this in general chemistry. But why were you taught to do that in general chemistry? What does it mean? That's one of the, the results that we're trying to figure out. But this is not the only way I could do it, right? I could instead have both of them beta spin. Or I could have the one in the 1s orbital alpha and the one in the 2s beta. Or I could do it the other way around, the one in the 1s beta and the one in the 2s alpha. Those are really the only four possibilities that we have here. Okay, now I'm going to work out the term symbols and I'm going to see what comes out of it. So again, I've got an L1, that's the orbital angular momentum for electron 1, and since electron 1, whichever one you want to call electron 1, it's in an S-type orbital, so that's 0, and L2 equals 0. Both electrons are in S-type orbitals. Well, then there's S1 and S2, but of course these are single electrons, so those must take on values of one half. So far, this has ended up just like our helium ground state, right? But now things get a little bit different. From here, I can write down a capital L, coupling L1 and L2, and the only possibility is capital L equals zero. That makes sense because both electrons are in S-type orbitals. S orbitals have no orbital angular momentum. As before, I see that capital S, however, can couple constructively or destructively to give me either 1 or 0 for my two electrons. So that's capital S, the total spin angular momentum. Now what we saw for the helium ground state was that capital S1 implied that both m sub s values for each electron, 1 and 2, had to be alpha spin. Well, I can do that now. Now that both electrons are not forced to be in the same orbital, both of them can be alpha spin, which means that this is an allowed configuration. This does not violate the Pauli exclusion principle. So both of those values of s are now allowed. That would lead me to a 2s plus 1 of 3, or a 2s plus 1 of 1. 
and then my main symbol, L, here is going to be an S-type state. But we end up with different J-type values. So let's take if L, S equals 0, 1, this gives me J value of, since J is L plus S all the way down to absolute value of L minus S, well, there's only one possibility, J has got to be 1. But if ls is 0, 0, which is the other possibility here, then j must be 0. Those are my only two possibilities. That means I get two different term symbols. My two term symbols are, if s is 1 and l is 0 and j is 1, that gives me a superscript 3 for the 2s plus 1 spin multiplicity, an L value of S, meaning it's a, an S type state, no orbital angular momentum state, and a subscript of 1. Okay, that's the first term. The second term is superscript of 1 for the spin multiplicity, again, an S type orbital angular momentum state, and 0. Two different term symbols implies two groups of wave functions each with their own energy. So here's one energy level, here's another energy level. Which one's lower? We don't know yet. We're going to get to that when we get to Hund's rules. But what's the degeneracy? Okay. We'll do this like a table. The degeneracy of the first state is 2j plus 1. Well, 2j plus 1, where j is 1, is 3. We call this a triplet state, right? So triplet, if I got a 3 in the superscript up there. Here, 2j plus 1 is 1. So this is triply degenerate. The triplet S1 state is triply degenerate. The singlet S0 state is non-degenerate or singly degenerate. But notice the total. They add up to 4, which is the total number of configurations I found when I rearrange my two electrons in my two orbitals with the two possible spins. Only four possibilities. So again, a triplet S1 and a singlet S0. The triplet S1 is triply degenerate according to the J value. The singlet S0 is non-degenerate according to the J value. But those are two different energy levels. Okay, and Pauli doesn't hit us with this one because both spins can be alpha or both can be beta in this case. All right. Now let's go on to uh, a larger example. It's going to be the carbon atom associated with uh, its ground state. So I'm going to erase all of this and come to the carbon atom. Carbon atom ground state. So a carbon atom has a total of six electrons. Its ground state electronic configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. As I said before, the important result that we got from, that we gleaned from the helium atom ground state, its 1s2 ground state, was that Closed shells do not contribute to the orbital angular momentum. They contribute zero, right? Because all the spin and orbital angular momentum in closed shells exactly cancels out total destructive interference. So that means that the 1s2 and 2s2 parts, which are both closed shells, contribute nothing to the term symbol, and I can ignore them. Everything hinges off the 2p2 configuration, this part right here. So that's all I'm going to deal with. I'm only going to deal with two electrons in my 2p set of orbitals. Now, how many possible ways are there for arranging two 2p type electrons in the orbitals that we have? Well, you might say, well, I've got three 2p type orbitals. They differ only in their m sub l quantum numbers, plus one, zero, and minus one. So that looks like I've got three orbitals, but don't forget, each electron can either be alpha or beta. So that means that there's actually, for each electron, there are six possibilities, right? I could have one electron going here as an alpha spin or beta spin in the plus one, alpha spin or beta spin in the zero, alpha spin or beta spin in the minus one. Since I have six possibilities for each electron, there's a simple rule of combinatorics. This is called six choose two. Six possibilities and two electrons to deal with. Okay? Again, there are six possibilities because I've got three m sub l values and two m sub s values. Okay? Three times two is six. But what does this six choose two mean from combinatorics? Okay? All that means is, this translates mathematically into six factorial, 
over 2 factorial times 6 minus 2 quantity factorial. Okay, so 6 factorial over 2 factorial times 4 factorial, right? And this comes out, if you work it out quickly, it comes out to 15. That means that there are 15 possible ways of arranging my two electrons in these orbitals. Let's write them all down. And not only that, I'm going to classify them according to m sub l and m sub s values using the rules that we saw before. But let's, let's just let's start with this. I'm going to have alpha spin and beta spin in the plus one. I could have alpha and beta spin in the zero. Or I could have alpha and beta spin in the minus one. That's three of the 15 possibilities. But let's keep going. Let's take now, let's put them in different orbitals. I'm going to stop putting one zero and minus one because you can tell what those are. Let's put spin up in one and spin down in zero this time. Or we'll do it the other way around. Spin down, spin up. Or I'll put spin up in one, spin down in minus one. Or reverse it. Okay, what am I up to? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Almost halfway there. I'm going to leave a little room in this column so I can add something. So stick with me. I could put them both in the latter two. So let's do spin up, spin down, and zero and minus one respectively. Or I could do spin down, spin up in those same two orbitals. But now I've got other possibilities, right? Those are the ones where I've got one alpha and one beta. But how about both alpha or both beta, all right? How about both alpha in one and zero? both beta in 1 and 0, both alpha in 1 and minus 1, both beta in 1 and minus 1, or both alpha in 0 and minus 1, or both beta in 0 and minus 1. So that's 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 15 possibilities. That's where this number comes from. I can't write down any other possibilities, right, where I put two electrons in my six possible, what we'll call, spin orbitals, right? Six possible spin orbitals. Now, since for each electron I have an m sub l and an m sub s, I can characterize a total m sub capital L and m sub capital S, meaning the, the z component of orbital angular momentum for the total orbital angular momentum and the z component for spin angular momentum for the total spin. So I'm going to characterize each of these configurations by their m sub l, m sub s pair. And if it's not clear what I'm doing yet, wait till I do a few and then you'll see what I'm getting at. m sub l, that's total m sub l here, right? So here I've got an electron in a plus one, here's another electron in a plus one. One plus one is two. So capital m sub l for this configuration is two, but one electron has an m sub s of plus one half, the other has an m sub s of minus one half, one half minus one half is zero. So every time you're going to see that when I have one of my electrons spin up and the other spin down, m sub s is zero. The value of m sub l, though, depends on their distribution. Here, both m sub l's are zero, and they're paired. Therefore, this one is a zero, zero pair. Next, here's both electrons in a minus one, and they're paired, alpha, beta. So that is a minus two, zero right? Minus 1, minus 1 is minus 2. All right, let's keep going. Here again they're paired, but now I've got one electron in a plus 1 and the other in a 0. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 half minus 1 half is 0. Here again, it's 1, right? 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 half minus 1 half is 0. And I can keep going. 1 minus 1 is 0. 1 half minus 1 half is 0, and then same for that. And here we go, I've got minus 1, 0, minus 1, 0, plus 1. Now the spins are different. 1 half plus 1 half is 1. And here, the m sub l value is 1, but minus 1 half minus 1 half is minus 1. And then 0, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1. So now I've characterized all 15 
Slater determinants. Don't forget that each one of these corresponds to that Slater determinant, that is the determinant of a two by two matrix that we described before. Each of those is a separate matrix, a separate determinant. And now I want to figure out how to group them. Remember, I'm trying to construct atomic term symbols representing the groupings of these or linear combinations of these into degenerate sets of wave functions. Okay. Now that I know that I have two electrons, one's, they're each in a p-type orbital, and I've got two possible spins, I can figure out what are the possible term symbols. Let's do that. So, S1 is one-half, S2 is one-half because they're individual electrons. So from that, just as I did before, I can couple to get a total capital S spin angular momentum quantum number of the sum or the difference, right? So one or zero. Those are my two possibilities. And now I have orbital angular momentum. They're both in p-type orbitals, therefore L1 is one and L2 is one. Well, that's more interesting. Now my possible L values are the sum of the two, that's the maximum, that's two. What's the minimum? One, uh, one minus one, absolute value, is zero. So the minimum value is zero, therefore there's a one in between, two, one, zero. Well, what all does this come out to be? How many possibilities then? If I put together all these S and L values, what are the possibilities? Let's see. If S is one, that corresponds to a spin multiplicity of three. So I could get a triplet. If L is two, that's a D term symbol. If S is zero, that's a spin multiplicity of one, which we call a singlet, also D. I could also have triplet P or triplet S or singlet P or singlet S. Wow, that's a lot of term symbols for this, but it's going to turn out several of those term symbols are not actually allowed by the Pauli anti-symmetry principle. We have to figure out which ones. All right, let's think about, let's start with, and this is a, a good practice, start with the highest value of S and L. That's the triplet D term symbol. A triplet means an S value of one, and D means an L value of two. Those are the total spin angular momentum and total orbital angular momentum quantum numbers. Don't forget, that for every value of capital S, you have a set of M sub S values, right? So let's write this down. If S, capital S, equals 1, capital M sub S equals 1, 0, or minus 1. Those are the three possibilities. And if L equals 2, M sub L equals 2, 1, 0, minus 1, or minus 2. That means for the triplet D term symbol to exist, in order to have a triplet D term symbol allowed by this set of wave functions, that's going to have to give me an M sub L, M sub S combination, right? So triplet D implies an M sub L, M sub S of, to include, that is, 2, 1, right? Because if L is 2, I've got to have an M sub L in there of 2. And if S is 1, I've got to have an M sub S of 1. So, of all these possibilities, and by the way, there are 3 times 5, 15 M sub L, M sub S combinations, one of them has to be 2, 1. We'll look at our list. I don't have an M sub L, M sub S of 2, 1. The closest I come is a 2, 0, or a 1, 1. That's not possible. In fact, in order to get a 2, 1, that would correspond to a configuration where both electrons are in the m sub l equals plus 1, and both electrons have m sub s equals plus 1 half, or alpha. That corresponds to that kind of a configuration, which violates the Pauli exclusion principle, as we've seen, and so triplet D is not allowed. That's not an allowed term symbol because it violates the Pauli exclusion principle. All right, we're making progress. So let's go on now to singlet D. 
I'm just going to go from highest spin in orbital angular momentum down the level of spin, and then I'm going to go down these columns this way and, and repeat the same analysis. So singlet D, that term symbol, corresponds to S equals 0 and L equals 2. If S equals 0, M sub L can only be 0. Excuse me, M sub S can only be 0. There's no other possibility. If L equals 2, then M sub L can be 2, 1, 0, minus 1, or minus 2. That's 1 times 5, or 5, possibilities. Well, you notice that one of those, by the way, has a maximum M sub L of 2 and M sub S of 0. So this must include M sub L, M sub S of 2, 0 as well as all the other combinations of 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 2, 0. Yes, all five possibilities. I look at my list. I do have a 2, 0. That must contribute, therefore, since it's got to be there, right, it must contribute to singlet D. So that term, so this, this particular configuration, this determinant, is part of singlet D. That's allowed. Well, then I've got a 1, 0, a 0, 0, minus 1, 0, and minus 2, 0. I'm just going to check off ones that correspond. There's the 2, 0. There's a minus 2, 0. I need a 1, 0. There's one of those. I need a minus 1, 0. There's one. And then, what was the last? Minus 2, 0, I already said. Did I skip 0, 0? Yes, I did. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Did I miss? 2, 0, 1, 0. 0, 0, minus 1, 0, minus 2. So 1, 2, 3, 4, five possibilities. Those are the five combinations. They're all accounted for in singlet D. That handles five of my 15 slider determinants. So singlet D has to be there. Let's go on to triplet P. Triplet P. Well, that corresponds to S equals 1, which means M sub S values of 1, 0, and minus 1. That corresponds to an L of 1, which means I have M sub L values of 1, 0, and minus 1. That means I need to see 1, 1, 0, 0. I actually have nine possibilities, right? So 9 M sub L, M sub S combinations. 9. OK, let's see. I would need 1, 1. 1, 0, 1, minus 1. There's a 1, 1. There's a 1, 0. There's a 1, minus 1. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. So let's see. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1. And then finally, minus 1, 1, here. Minus 1, 0, there. And minus 1, minus 1. Let's mark off all of those because they're all there, and they must be there to account for those nine. So let's see, I said I had to have one one, that's checked off, one zero, one minus one. Zero one, there he is, zero zero, there's one, and zero minus one. And then finally, minus one one, minus one zero, and minus one minus one. I've now accounted for 14 out of 15 total. That means that triplet P must be included in my set of term symbols. Now you can see where this is headed because what about singlet P is next, right? Singlet P, that's an S of 0, so an M sub S of 0. L of 1, M sub L of 1, 0, minus 1. That suggests that I've got to still have three more determinants a 1, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, 0. But I've already counted for those that already have to be in there because of higher angular momentum values. The only thing left is 0, 0. I don't have enough to account for this. Therefore, singlet P is gone. Triplet S works out similarly. Triplet S, that's an S of 1. So M sub S values are 1, 0, and minus 1. L is 0, so M sub L, whoops can only be zero. That's three combinations. I've only got one left, and I don't have one zero and minus one zero, or I should say zero one and zero minus one available. So 
triplet S is not allowed. The only one left is singlet S. That corresponds to S equals 0, L equals 0, M sub S is 0, M sub L equals 0, and that's my last determinant available. And now I've accounted for all 15. Again, based on M sub L, M sub S values, I can see that singlet D has to be five wave functions, triplet P has to be nine wave functions, and singlet S has to be one. Five plus nine plus one is 15, which accounts for all 15 of the components. And now I've got my LS uh, atomic term symbols. I want to know what are the possible Js. Let's go over here to do that. Singlet D corresponds to S of 0, L of 2. So the allowed values of J are only 2, nothing else. So that becomes singlet D2 for the total uh, term symbol. Triplet P. Triplet P has S equal to 1, L equal to 1. So, I'm sorry, this should not be L, this is a J equals 2. J can be equal to 2, 1, or 0. All three possibilities. That corresponds to triplet P2, triplet P1, or triplet P0. Three different term symbols arising from triplet P. And then finally, the singlet S, which is S equals 0, L equals 0, J can only be 0, which means that that is singlet S 0. So bringing in all of the possibilities here, I get five total term symbols, including the total angular momentum J, and I can work out their degeneracies based on the J values. Two times two plus one, so that's two J plus one, that's a five-fold degeneracy here. Here the J value is two, two times two plus one is also five, yes? Two times one plus one, that comes out to three. Two times zero plus one is one, two times zero plus one is one. Let's add those up. Five plus five is 10, plus three is 13, 14, 15. 15 total, which matches the initial set of states. We have, therefore, accounted for all of the possible wave functions. Now, I've got five term symbols. We've done other examples, right? We've had different numbers of term symbols. Don't forget, each term symbol corresponds to a group of degenerate wave functions. That means that for the 2p2 configuration of a carbon atom, or any 2p2 configuration, doesn't have to be a carbon atom, anything with two electrons and a 2p type orbital, I have five energy levels corresponding to that configuration. Which one's lowest? This is where we come to what are called Hund's rules. The first of these rules you already know, even though you may not have heard it called that. Hund's rules. Now you have to admit, though, that Hund's rules sometimes fail, especially for larger atoms. Uh, and so I like to jokingly call these Hun strongly worded suggestions, right? They do work a lot, uh, but they're not absolutely perfect. Hun's first rule is, this is uh, for largest spin angular momentum is most stable. And what I mean by that is lowest energy. The largest value of S. Huh, okay. So if I look at these, I see that, well, there's a singlet D2, there's a singlet S0, but all three of these are triplets. That means that the triplet P sets are going to, we expect them anyway, by Hund's rules, to be lower in energy than either the singlet D or the singlet S. Now think about, think about how you get a high spin multiplicity. High S corresponds to as many M sub S values maximum as you can get. Remember how you were always taught, right, to fill in electrons in different orbitals but with all their spins aligned. That's how you get a high spin multiplicity. M sub s of one half plus m sub s of one half is a total m sub s of one, which gives you 
a 2s plus 1 of 3. That's Huns' first rule. So when you were taught this in general chemistry or high school chemistry, it was actually a reference to Huns' first rule. That's where it comes from. Of course, I haven't told you where Huns' first rule comes from. That's for another class, uh, but it's also very interesting. Now, but I have three of these triplets. How do I know which of those is less? Well, when the second rule says that for the same S, the largest orbital angular momentum. Hmm. Well, it doesn't help us in this case, does it? Because all three of these have exactly the same orbital angular momentum of L. Okay, so we aren't really getting anywhere with that. However, if I had one state that was a triplet P, and imagine for that configuration I have another state that's a triplet D, then the triplet D would be lower in energy than the triplet P because it has a higher value of L. All right, so that's when we get to Hun's third rule, is for distinguishing among, distinguishing among these. For the same S and L, the smallest j equals most stable if, if the shell is less than half filled. Conversely, the largest j is most stable if the shell is more than half filled. Well, what will you say? Well, what if the, 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 the shell were exactly half filled? In that case, you wouldn't even get to Hun's third rule. You'd have already figured out which one was the most stable by rules one and two. So you don't have to worry about that case. But what about this situation? Well, remember, I have a 2p2 configuration. A p orbital can contain at most, excuse me, a p shell can hold at most six electrons. Therefore, this is less than half filled. Therefore, I want the smallest j among these three that have the same l and s. The lowest energy term symbol, therefore, corresponds to a triplet p zero term symbol. And then I can order them differently for the rest, right? So then I would expect triplet p one to be next, triplet p two to be next. But between the singlet D and singlet S, I would expect the singlet D to be lower in energy than singlet S, but above all the triplet P levels. So that's how I can order my groups of wave functions by Huynh's first, second, and third rules. I want to make one more uh, point before we, before we close. Um, and that has to do with what about when you deal with a situation where I have more electrons than this. When I get to a 2p3 configuration, you can handle three electrons by exactly the same techniques that I've been telling you, and your book gives you some elaboration on this. But what if I have more than half-filled shells? What if I have a 2p4 configuration? Remember, the p shell can hold at most six electrons. I could go through and go through all the trial of coupling the spin and orbital angular momenta of four different electrons using all the techniques that we just saw. This can be quite a lot of work. But what you'd find if you went to all that work is that a 2p4 configuration gives you, what do you know, five term symbols. Those five term symbols are singlet S0, singlet D2, triplet P2, triplet P1, and triplet P0. In other words, 2p4 gives you exactly the same term symbols as a 2p2 configuration. So when I've got two electrons in a p orbital, and I couple all the angular momenta, I get exactly the same result as when I have four electrons in a p-type orbital, p-shell, and I couple the, the, uh, all the orbital angular momenta and spin angular momenta. Why? This is something called the particle hole symmetry. Let's write down a single configuration of a P4 shell, right? Let's put two there and the plus one, two there. I have four electrons, four particles, in other words, and two holes. Notice that the number of holes is exactly the same as the number of electrons in a P2 configuration. 
So it turns out that to figure out the angular momenta, I could couple all the angular momenta of my four electrons in the P4 configuration, or I could couple the angular momenta of my holes. I've got two holes right here. And for all the 15 possibilities, notice 6 choose 4 rather than 6 choose 2 is 6 factorial over fat, uh, 4 factorial times 6 minus 4 factorial, which is, what do you know, 15. There's a symmetry between these two. Similarly, so I'll say that these are equivalent in terms of term symbols. I also could note that a 2p1 configuration is going to be equal to a 2p5 configuration. They give the same term symbols. Or if I have Ds, what do you know? How many uh, electrons does a D shell hold? 10. So a D1 configuration is the same as a D9. A D2 is the same as a D8, and so on. So make your life easy. If I ever give you a problem or you encounter a problem where you need to deal with large numbers of electrons in a, in a shell like this, switch the number of particles to the holes and deal with the simpler case which means those that less than half filled. All right, that, uh, that concludes the discussion on atomic term symbols. I hope you found it useful.